sit. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I hope you all had a very good weekend. Uh, it's great to be back at Parliament after a, a very short recess, but our government is absolutely determined to get things done and to push on with improving the lives of everyday New Zealanders. Uh, you've heard me talk a lot about the notion that people have both rights and responsibilities to each other and to our country. And I think everyone agrees that the state must always provide a safety net for New Zealanders who have fallen on hard times. And that's not in dispute here. <clears throat> and state houses will always play a very important part of that safety net. But it is a sad fact that a small number of people actually abuse their right to state housing. People in New Zealand are privileged to have the right to be housed by the taxpayer, but with that right also comes responsibilities. We've all heard the horror stories about Kaingaora tenants who are so threatening, so abusive, so violent that their neighbours live in fear every day. We've all seen the photos of Kaingaora homes that have been systematically, deliberately trashed by the very people who get to live there on the taxpayer's dollar. It's certainly not fair to the neighbours of those abusive tenants, many of whom are fellow Kaingaora tenants, to have to live in fear or to have sleepless nights each and every week. And it's certainly not fair to the thousands of people on the social housing wait list, many of whom are families with young children who are waiting for a home and would treat that home with the love and the respect that it deserves. Today, we're saying enough is enough. Finance Minister Nicola Willis and Housing Minister Chris Bishop, who joins me here today, have sent a letter of expectations to the board of Kyanga Ora, instructing them to end the sustaining tenancies framework the policy that has effectively stopped evictions of those who abuse their responsibilities as Kyanga Ora tenants. Ending sustaining tenancies is also part of the National Act Coalition Agreement. Kyanga Ora has been told to take stronger measures against disruptive tenants, and those measures could include eviction for severe and persistent cases. I want to be very clear, very clear, that the vast majority of Kyanga Ora tenants are already doing the right thing. They look after their homes and they are courteous to their neighbours and they pay their rent. They are appreciative of their fellow citizens who are subsidising their living through the taxes that those workers pay. But for those who choose to repeatedly engage in disruptive and in threatening or damaging behaviour, from now on there will be consequences. And I'll pass to Minister Chris Bishop to talk a little bit more about that detail. Uh, thank you Prime Minister. As the Prime Minister has said, uh, Finance Minister Nicola Willis and I have uh, sent an interim letter of expectations to the board of Kainga Ora Homes uh, and Communities. Now it's slightly unconventional to send an interim letter because uh, of course uh, as you'll all know they're going through that review uh, led by Sir Bill English but we've uh, taken this step to make sure that Kainga Ora is focused on the right things uh, right now. So in that letter we've laid out our expectation that uh, KO focuses on its core functions uh, those are firstly replacing the sustaining tenancies framework and strengthening the management of disruptive tenants which the Prime Minister has talked to. We have uh, asked Kainga Ora to, in fact we've directed them, uh, to make better use of the tools in the Residential Tenancies Act 1986. That will include formal warning notices, relocations and in severe uh, and persistent cases terminating tenancies. We've also asked Kainga Ora to address a concerning escalation in rent arrears. Between 2017 and 2023, the amount of rent owed to Kainga Ora increased from $1 million to $21 million, uh, due in good part, we believe, to the Sustaining Tenancies Framework, where tenants were not evicted even if they stopped paying rent. At the end of last year, more than 450 Kainga Ora tenants each owed more than $10,000 in rent. Uh, owing a huge amount in rent isn't good for anyone, not the taxpayer and not the tenants themselves, and Kainga Ora has been instructed to fix that. We've also uh, instructed Kainga Ora to tenant vacant properties as quickly as possible, and I've talked about this before at the start of the year. The fact is that at any given time there are thousands of Kainga Ora properties sitting vacant, uh, and of the newly built KO homes last year, 20% of, of them sat vacant for more than a month after completion. And as you know, the wait list is 25,000 strong. Uh, many of those people are waiting anxiously for a state house. We want those people off, state off the wait list and into a state house. We've also instructed Kainga Ora to work hard to deliver new social housing places and lines uh, in line with targets. Uh, we expect them to meet those targets and to keep us updated along the way. And we've asked them to uh, deliver value for money in its spending. Uh, again, this is fairly self-explanatory. We are working hard as a coalition government to get the economy back on track. 
That means uh, Kainga Ora, homes and communities, along with every government agency, needs to make sure they uh, deliver value for money for every dollar uh, they spend. As uh, you know, there's an independent review into KO uh, underway, being led by Sibyl English. I can um, advise you that uh, we're expecting a report back on that at the end of the month. Uh, and then ministers will be taking time to carefully consider those recommendations and getting advice on them more needed, uh, uh, getting advice on them where, where we need to. And after that, we'll be in a position to, to make more public comment around, around that. Um, over to you, Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, in terms of my movements this week, I'm in Wellington for the next three days. Uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister will make a short call on me this afternoon, and I will be attending Grant Robertson's valedictory on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday, I'm in Auckland. On Friday, I'm in my electorate. And on Saturday, I'll be in Tauranga. Uh, this week in the House, we'll be debating further stages of the Taxation Annual Rates Bill, which will include a government amendment paper to deliver on election and coalition agreement promises. We will also pass the European Union Free Trade Agreement Legislation Bill this week so that it can come into force by May. That's a very good thing because that will actually create significant savings that will benefit New Zealand exporters uh, for this coming season, primarily in horticulture, seafood and honey. And with that, very happy to take your questions. Prime, Prime, Prime Minister, how many people will be homeless uh, as a result of this policy? Change? Well, what this is all about is actually fairness. Uh, what is not right at the moment is there are no consequences for people being behind in their rents uh, or, importantly, also being disruptive tenants. And so the reality is it's not fair to those tenants uh, of Kaingora that are actually paying their salaries. It's also not are uh, paying their rents. It's also not fair to, frankly, um, those that are on the wait list. Uh, that's yeah, just we want to get a house. I appreciate that, but do you have any oversight as to how many people are using the service now and how, therefore, may then end up in, in homelessness? Say the question again. So how many people are in this in this framework now or part of this framework and how many people may end up homeless? Well, every, every kind or a tenant is subject to sustaining tenancies. We're asking, in fact, directing kind or to end that framework and to take uh, stronger action uh, against people who breach their obligations as kind or tenants. Uh, there are hundreds uh, of kind or tenants uh, who, over the last uh, few years, uh, have engaged in disruptive, antisocial, uh, in some cases, in many cases, illegal behaviour. Uh, we're saying to kind or uh, you need to uh, use the tools that are legally at your disposal already uh, in order to take action against those tenants. And I think. Well, homeless people? No, that's not a, that's not the uh, the right uh, implication of what I'm saying. Actually, what we're saying is Kainga Ora has tools available under the law right now to use against tenants who breach uh, their tenancy agreements. Mm. Essentially, sustaining tenancies have meant that Kainga Ora has not been using those tools that are legally at their disposal. That. Every other landlord, uh, including private sector landlords, uh, have at their disposal. We're saying what's good, what's good for private landlords uh, should be good for Kainga Ora because it's in the interests of the tenants themselves and it's also in the interests of neighbours and it's in the interests of taxpayers as well. Hang on, guys, just we'll go one at a time. Jason. How do you see this playing out in terms of the use of this... Um, new policy? Do you see it as a blunt tool to come down on people hard or something like as a bit of a deterrent to say that there is actually going to be consequences now? Where does this sort of balance lie here? Well, look, there's a clear process, as there is with all sanctions, essentially. There's lots of advance warning. The easiest thing for a tenant to do is to get themselves um, meeting their obligations and, and uh, being in compliance with their, their behaviour as a, as a good tenant of KO. Uh, the reality is this is about fairness. You, you know, we, have, we have a huge waiting list of, I think, over 24,000 people. It's gone up 20,000 people over the period of the last six years. Those are families that are desperate to get a state house. They would love the privilege of being able to have one. And as a result, and as a result the reality is we're not there to accommodate people who don't want to hold up their end of the deal. Uh, that's Those very that simple. are going to be evicted, where do you expect them to go? Uh, well, the, the first instance is for people to change their behaviour. So I'll give you, some, give you some numbers. Um, there are hundreds of serious incidences every month. So um, from August to October last year, there were 207 per month. There were 335 per month from November 2023 through to January uh, 2024. Now, serious incidents include alleged illegal activity, harassment, intimidation, threatening behaviour and verbal abuse. That is unacceptable. That is not the way in which people should live their lives. If you are a kind or a tenant, you should be behaving in the same way that everybody else behaves uh, in, in, in society. And uh, if you engage in this sort of behaviour, uh, then our instruction to Kainga Ora is for them to use the tools that are that are at their disposal. And so the first instance, it should be that people mm. change their behaviour 
uh, and make sure that they don't engage in that sort of behaviour, which is causing disruption and mayhem for neighbours, uh, friends and family, uh, and people who live in these communities. That's the first thing. will be put on notice as well. So you sent the interim letter to KO, and now you expect the, the tenants to now be put on notice? Well, I'm fairly sure these announcements will get a bit of wide publicity. And so have, but will, you be doing, will you be requesting that they give uh, tenants official notice that they are now... That they have been put on yep. um, notice themselves, and how long will that period be? Y yes, uh, the short the short answer is yes, and that will be the responsibility of Kaunga Ora. We we as ministers and as the government have sent this letter of expectation. We therefore we now expect Kaunga Ora to implement that letter of expectation, and that will involve uh, communication with with tenants of Kaunga Ora. Sorry, guys, can we go to sorry sorry you, sorry, you, can, you, sorry brother, can we go to Jenna and then Joe? You keep talking about. Fairness um, and the amount of families that are on that state house waitlist. Do you have the numbers for how many of those um, breaches, those hundreds of breaches every month? How many of those people have kids living in the house, and where do those kids go? Uh, the short point is no, but we can we can get that for you. But, but where do the kids go? Well, it, 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 you're presupposing that those tenants will be automatically evicted from those houses. Okay, so our first. The first reason we are doing this is to make is to send a message that tenants who engage in this sort of behaviour need to change their behaviour. At the end of the day, there has to be a backstop for the government to say, if you continue to persistently and repeatedly engage in this sort of behaviour, there has to be a backstop for the government to say, enough is enough, I'm sorry, you can't continue to engage in this sort of behaviour. So, we don't want to kick people out of Kainga Ora properties. We don't want to evict people. But the sustaining tenancies framework has meant that people essentially know that there is no, at the end of the day, one of the consequences will not be eviction from a, a Kainga Ora property. That has meant bad behaviour, rising bad behaviour, and also, frankly, people not paying their rent. That's why, and partly why we have $17 million. No, 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 sorry, no, no, no child will be made homeless by this change in policy. No Kiwi child. Well, what we can guarantee is that there's already ch Kiwi children today that are waking up in pretty scungy motels and in pretty suboptimal conditions that their family is on a wait list trying to get one of these houses. And so I just say, I just say, no child will what, be made homeless by this well, what I'd say to you is actually, if you think about the, if it's bad for the neighbours dealing with unruly tenants who are actually abusing them and threatening them, it's pretty bad for the, the so kids that are involved in those families. And we'd like to see the government agencies promise. involved with those families so if they're not already doing so. Will there be a different policy if? If there are children living in the home, is there, is there a different set of criteria for a tenant to be evicted if there are kids living in the home? That, that's an ultimately a policy decision for Kainga Ora as part of how they... The policy it, decisions. Is, are you comfortable if yeah, kids are being evicted? There's a, there's a, we are directing them to update their policies to take a stronger stance against uh, tenants uh, who engage in antisocial behaviour, the implementation of that policy will now be over to Kainga Ora, and we will, of course, be following up as ministers as to what but that the, policy but the means. But the practice. simple thing is that for that tenant is to get themselves compliant and to meet their obligations. That's the first and foremost thing. If you, it, the kid doesn't have any control. Sure, and as a result, that's why if I, if I, I'll just say to you that those are the behaviours that we're seeing that are pretty aggressive and pretty threatening uh, within neighbourhoods of Kaingora communities. I'll just say to you, I think we would need to have agencies in with those families immediately as well. Do you guys, Chris, have, you guys have thought about the kids? Because <coughs> you came here, Minister, armed with the number of unruly tenants, but you didn't have the numbers that Jenna asked for of, of how many of those people had children living with them. So did you even think about... The kids you oh, we're thinking about the kids that are actually on that state house wait list that are actually in pretty suboptimal housing conditions, and their families would love to get a state house. But you don't have any uh, so idea those are the ones that we're thinking about as well. But are you not thinking about the children that are currently in state We are, houses? we are. Yes, and as I said to you, I imagine that there'll be government agencies involved where we see extreme threatening and abusive behaviour from their parents to their communities. Are they also involved in this policy? Sorry? Is Oranga Tamariki, are they also involved in this policy rollout? Well, they may well be, as 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 a range of issues get heightened, if there's, a, if there's behavioural issues within a family or abuse within a family or a bad environment for kids to be within a family, that's what I said before, I would expect the government agencies to be deployed as as they often are. But what I'm saying is, at this point in time, we, we can't, you cannot take a state house and not hold your deal up. 
you cannot take your responsibility seriously, that actually you've been given that house or subsidised that house because Kiwis who are waking up this morning, going to work, paying their taxes, actually get that, subsidise that living of, that, of you in that place and you need to respect that and need to be, and hold up that responsibility. Did you ask for any advice, Minister, did you ask for any advice about the implications on children living in these households before you announced this policy? We, 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 took a range, we took a range of advice on a range of matters. I, I, don't, I don't have the uh, right here with me the number of uh, serious incidents, including uh, from disruptive tenants and their, their relationship to children. I don't have that with me right in front of me. Did That's all I'm saying. Did you ask for specific advice relating to children living in these households when you were developing this policy? We, we took a range of advice in, in, um, in our de determining the uh, statement of expectations. No, Sorry, guys, we're going to go to Joe. Joe Moy. Um, Chris, just going back to the, the one you used before, the 335 serious complaints per month. Mm actually to three tenancies being ended. What's a number that you would think, I guess, would be more fitting in terms of the serious complaints and how many tenancies you think should be ending based on that number? Well, I, I think it's, it's impossible to say, uh, it, it, hypothetically. All I'll say to you is that 335 serious incidents per month is unacceptable, uh, and I think only evicting three tenants is unacceptable as well. So I want to see the number of incidences go down. Uh, I don't necessarily want to see the number of evictions go up, uh, but I want to see the number of incidents go down, and I want to see Kainga or tenants uh, behaving better in their properties. I should say the vast bulk of the thousands of people who live in state houses do a fantastic job, and 85% of people pay their rent on time. So we are not, we are not talking about huge numbers of people here, but the ones who, who we are talking about are causing mayhem in communities and we're sending a very clear message from the government that you can't continue to behave like this. And if you do, at the, at, at the worst extreme, there will be consequences. And I think that will have flow-on effects for better behaviour throughout the system. Well, okay, sorry, Joe, and then sorry, we'll go to Claire second, and Ben. A couple more questions. Yeah. Um, because looking at the letter of expectation you've seen, I mean, it is, if you boil it down, it looks like micromanagement. I mean, you're really asking KO to be extremely timely with all of their targets. You're asking them to ask you before they can do anything, even if it's within their existing delegations. Is this effectively a ministry that you think is completely and utterly failing, being told that you cannot do anything without the minister's permission now? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't put it that quite that way. Uh, but... We've been fairly frank as a yeah. government about our concerns about the way Kainga Ora has been operating. Uh, and we've asked them to address rental arrears. I think all New Zealanders will be worried about that. We've asked them to replace the framework. We've also asked them to lift their game when it comes to community engagement. One of the things you do often hear from, from communities is that they don't like the idea of Kainga Ora building houses in suburbs or neighbourhoods. And frankly, one of the reasons people sometimes dislike that is precisely because of the disruptive tenants which make its way into the media all the time. Uh, and they also dislike the idea of social housing in their communities. Actually, social housing has a really important role to play in New Zealand society. It, there will always be a role for state housing, and I want communities uh, to be OK with people building, with the government building state houses and the community housing sector as well. So we've asked them to lift their game when it comes to community engagement, and I see the management of disruptive tenants as part and parcel of rebuilding the social licence for social housing. That's really important. And, and, and I, guess, I guess there's also you know, almost 600 you know, ready-to-let houses that are available uh, that actually we want to be able to speed up the, the transition of getting families into those homes. They're ready to go now. And as a result, we've got to speed that up. So the reality is there is a review of Kaingora going on because we have serious concerns about the performance of the organisation. But in parallel, we're sending this letter out to make sure there's very cl good clarity on the four things we want to see change on. You've CC'd Andrew McKenzie into it. Well, you've got Andrew McKenzie, who is a staunch defender of the no eviction policy. He's on the record saying, quote, we set up to house people, not to make people homeless. How concerned are you about the people at the top there and the message that you're sending and these new targets and what you want them to do and whether they're actually open to that? Well, the, the government owns Kainga Ora, uh, and I am the Minister of Housing. Uh, and alongside the Minister of Finance, we have issued a letter of expectation to Kainga Ora. We expect them to follow what the government has set for them. And just very lastly, on the 1st of Feb in 2017, Amy Adams, the then Housing Minister, launched the pilot for the um, sustain, what is it? sustaining tenancies. Um, she was doing it through a social investment lens. How come you, given the social investment response that this government is saying that it's giving, um, why can't you just keep this and put that social investment lens back over it in a better way than it was obviously 
not done last time? Well, sustaining tenancies under the last national government started with the best will in the world, but it has not been implemented in a way that I think meets with the community expectations around disruptive tenants, and it hasn't worked. That's why we're changing it. We do want to move to a social investment framework when it comes to social housing. Uh, obviously we've got the Kainga Aura review underway, we're going to need to wait and see what comes back at, uh, towards the end of the month around that. Uh, we are also, as you know, we campaigned on a variety of changes to social housing, uh, including adopting a social investment lens. That work is on a um, slow, slower time frame, it's not something we can do straight away. It would be fair to say that the social housing funding system and the structure of social housing support in New Zealand is a mess. Uh, that's one of the things I've spent the last uh, couple of months getting my head around alongside Tama Potaka. So I'll, I'll have more to say about that in due course. But By the last government was a failure though. Well, the, the sustaining tenancies framework as it has been implemented since November 2017 has not worked. So if you want Sorry, can we go to Claire and then come down to Ben? That was a question. Sorry, can we go to Ben? To, to the Housing Minister, does the government intend to uphold the decisions of Wellington City Council relating to the district plan and its um, large chunk of the city upzoned? Well, as you know, I can't make a comment on that because I'm the decision maker. What's Just to give you a little process update on that, um, what's happening is the uh, City Council has um, obviously come to its, its view on the recommendations of the IHP and has put a series of recommendations to me uh, as Minister responsible for RMA reform. That hasn't actually made its way through to me yet. Um, I think that happens from memory on Thursday. And then statutorily, uh, there's a range of advice that will be provided to me. So I expect I will be in a position to make a decision on that uh, towards the end of April. And Prime Minister, um, now that you're aware what trainee policemen and women actually earn, does it put a different lens on how tough people are doing it in this cost of living crisis? Like, are you inclined to change your pay offer to police, for instance? Well, look, I mean, as I said, um, you know, our pay negotiations with police, between police and the police association are ongoing. We'll continue to negotiate in good faith uh, with them, and uh, I'm sure there's a wee way to go with that, um, but we'll continue that conversation. Uh, yes, I got my numbers wrong in my interview with Tova the other day. Uh, it's because I had a briefing talking about uh, the average constatory cost uh, remuneration, which is about $99,000. Actually, first year police officers, 75. So you misheard that? Or Sorry? No, I just had, I'd, I'd received, a, I'd been reading a bunch of briefings the day before actually on, on police pay in particular and I, I mixed up my numbers. Oh, oh, police, can I ask you a couple, can I just put to sure. you a few examples from, these are from police officers who have emailed into us just um, explaining how they're feeling and, that, and I'll just ask you to respond to them. This is from a detective of seven years. I've been to multiple deceased persons in the last month, some suicide, some have been there for some time, some of the deceased have involved children. I've had a knife pulled on me by an offender yeah. when I was trying to arrest him and I've also dealt with multiple rape complaints. Yeah. We don't join the job for the pay but it's embarrassing when the PM thinks our starting salary is 90000 I'm not even on that now after seven years. Well, what I said to you, as I said, I've been doing a bunch of reading you know, the days before about police pay briefings, actually, and I, I mixed up the... The average constabulary remuneration is actually ninety-nine thousand dollars. The starting starting remuneration for a first-year police officer seventy-five thousand dollars. What about to this cop? Policing takes pieces of your soul. I've seen more death than anyone in the thirties should ever have to. I resigned last Friday on hearing the latest offer. Yeah, look, incredibly tough times for police. I mean, they have been. You know, we need to make sure we're backing them with the right tools and support. Uh, we obviously are working hard to try and get to a, a negotiation around pay. It's been a long-going ongoing negotiation that started with the previous administration. We're continuing to negotiate with them in good faith. I want to say thank you to all of our police officers. They do a phenomenal job, an incredible job, as do our teachers, as do our nurses, as do our first responders. Uh, we are going to continue to work with the police association. Uh, the police will do that in the negotiation through, through, through the union negotiation. And we are doing our part in the government to make sure we're backing up police by giving them more tools uh, and support. Okay, sorry, Em. Yeah, was, that, uh, was the matter of the police pay offer discussed in Cabinet? Uh, uh, we, we, yes, we just got a verbal, an oral update, uh, but again, uh, those are ongoing conversations between police and the police association. Police minister, presumably. Sorry? That was from uh, Mark Mitchell, presumably. Um, well, we just had, it was one of our oral items, but again, I don't go into conversations in Cabinet. Yeah. Have you spoken to Winston Peters about the comments he made yesterday about Nazi Germany? No, I haven't had a chance to do so, but, uh, um, but I do, we talk regularly and I plan to talk to him about it. What are you going to say to him? Well, look, I just from my point of view, they, they're not, that's not what I would say. Uh, I don't think they, that is, um, uh, you know, those, those aren't 
the way that I would phrase it at all. I just think in general across the politics, across the parties, across all uh, across the aisle, that there's actually a need for everyone to be very careful with their language. You know, I've seen Chris Hipkins refer to our government as a dictatorship. I've seen you know the Māori Party refer to us as white supremacists who have got some sort of genocide agenda. I don't think any of that inflam inflammatory language is very helpful at all. Uh, Following on from that, Prime Minister, Minister sorry, Jenna. Could I? Sorry, to Sean, I'll come back to you. Let me finish, Jenna. Do you, do you think that that comparison is? Uh, language befitting of a Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister? Well, as I said, I don't agree with those comments. That's not something that I would express. I'm just calling on people from all political parties to maintain the civility in our politics, and I don't think extreme language on either side from any particular party um, um, is actually helpful or, or, or necessary. In relation to that, Prime Minister, uh, have you or are you reviewing Professor Joanna Kidman's role as part of the uh, anti-extremist centre in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, given that she called your government a death cult. Yeah, sorry, look, I haven't been briefed on that. I can't comment on that. Just on what, oh, did you want to follow up? Well, uh, when are you going to be briefed on it, or are you relaxed about that? Oh, there's a lot of other uh, more important things i just put to you that I'm pretty focused on at the moment, which is actually how we rebuild this economy when we've got some pretty choppy economic times so that we're going through, how we job. restore law and order, and how we deliver better health she's and education. You're in a job then? Well, again, again, I haven't been briefed on it, um, and that we've, yeah, I can, we have more to say about it later. Just, just one, just one. That, um, Sorry. Can I just confirm New Zealanders will see their tax cuts in July? Sorry? Can I confirm that New Zealanders will see a tax cut Absolutely. in July? Absolutely. Absolutely. We will be announcing our tax relief plan in the budget. Um, the details of that will be revealed at that point in time. And it won't look exactly the same as what was in National's plan? Well, we are very comfortable that we can deliver fully tax, you know, fully funded tax relief. Um, part of that, as we've talked about before, will be through revenue raising measures. Part of it will be through savings that have been identified. But what is important is that we actually can get tax relief to low and middle income working New Zealanders uh, who actually deserve a break and actually that's their way we can help them support them through the cost of living crisis. Can I just check you off? On what you said, you said um, New Zealanders will see the tax relief plan when it comes out to the budget. So are they just going to see plan a plan, or when is this actually going to come into fruition? Because uh, of this again, what you'll see is our, we'll announce our whole package in the budget uh, and at the end of May. Until that process, uh, I'm not going to say too much more about it. The situation in terms of the budget right now, we had Winston Peters over the weekend talking about some $5.6 billion hole. We've had Nic Nicola Willis talking about these fiscal issues that you've been having for some time. It very much seems like your ministers are very softly, softly downplaying the situation so you can come to the budget and say, this is what we wanted to do, however, we can't. So what's actually going on? Well, I don't, think it's been, right I don't think it's been softly, softly. I think every week that I've been here with you, I've, I've communicated to you what we see as a deteriorating, deteriorating set of economic conditions in New Zealand. Uh, we've got you know inflation, we've got high interest rates, we've got a slowing economy, we'll see GDP numbers later out this week, uh, and we've obviously got a risk of rising unemployment. Employment. So, you know, what we're doing as a government is saying, right, well, that's the situation we've inherited. Uh, we're being really clear about these issues as we encounter them. Cost overruns, deliberate underfunding, poor delivery of projects. Uh, but there's no doubt about it. We've got a very volatile and a very deteriorating economic set of circumstances. So what that was in the coalition agreements with both ACT and New Zealand First is now on the chopping block or subject to change because of the fix fiscal situation that you'd be talking about? Look, our, our commitments as we as we built them in that negotiation period was that we built strong agreements between all three parties and all three parties signed up for that. Our agreements to each other and our commitments to each other are pretty clear. Uh, so for us, there's, there's, you know, we're going to keep working towards that. But it is on but the chopping block. What we're trying to get clear about is a budget for the end of May that actually addresses the situation that we're in, which yeah, is that, that. ultimately... Know, on the chopping block from the coalition negotiations, Winston Peters seemed to imply that whatever was on the table with him and your and the National Party was fine. Does that imply that there's other things on there that will now not be um, achieved? No, that hasn't been the time? nature of our conversations. We're very comfortable with our coalition agreements with each other. They, you know, we are very, you know, that's our work plan. That's what we've agreed to. That's what we've committed to doing. But what we're trying to signal is that yes, we've got some very challenging economic times ahead of us at the moment. It's going to be a pretty tough year, I suspect. What we're doing is making sure that as those forecasts, as that volatility emerges, that we're, we're doing everything we can to set up a budget that finds the right balance of actually making sure we continue to grow the economy, which is ultimately what we have to do. We have to be able to grow our way out of the malaise that we're in. At the same time, we have to put back in place a culture of good fiscal financial discipline, and that's exactly what we're doing with our savings and our efficiency program. Sorry. 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 You are in, in the election campaign, you obviously had another revenue-raising measure in the foreign buyer um, tax. 
that's now gone. Are you looking for a new revenue raising mechanism to fill that gap, or, or how are you looking to fill that shortfall? Look, we, we'll be re you'll see it all revealed in the budget, but all I just say to you is that we will have a fully funded tax relief plan for lower middle income working New Zealanders. Uh, it'll be a com combination of revenues. Uh, those revenues may look slightly different than what it was before the election. They might look the same, but there's ups and under, there's uh, unders and overs on, on all of that. And equally, we've got a savings program that's up and running, uh, and that we're very comfortable we'll get delivered as well. But will there be any, any any new, any new revenue raising measures that may Again, be we're in the middle of the process of, of budget discussion. Um, you have to wait can to you, the budget. Can you rule out introducing a new tax to the budget? Uh, again, uh, that is not our intention. What we're focused on is making sure that we can generate revenues, make sure we generate savings, and therefore pass on tax relief to working New Zealanders. Well, we'll today. Can can now sorry, to sorry, to sorry Amelia, I'll just go to Claire. I'll, I'll commit to you. Can, can you commit to the same... Well, well, Thomas, no? you're not you're not clear, you, mate. No, I, <laughs> what, we speak with one voice. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> Synergy. Yeah, yeah. That's a frightening um, thought. Can you commit to the same quantum of tax relief for every New Zealander as you promised, promised in your tax plan? So Again, all amount. of that's going to be revealed when we reveal the budget at the, the end, at the end of May. But what I just say to you is we are deeply committed to delivering tax relief, as I've said before, to lower middle income working New Zealanders. Um, and we think it's very necessary, we think it's entirely appropriate, that they're supported in a cost of living crisis uh, and it will be good. Is it possible that some of the other things in the um, coalition agreements will be pushed out to outer years later than you had hoped, originally hoped to put them into place? Well, we've got. The look, we're going to meet our obligations and our commitments to each other through our coalition arrangements and agreements. Um, um, whether or not they turn out to be affordable. Sorry. Whether or not they turn out to be. Affordable. Well, well, we'll manage our way through that. But I'll just say to you, at the moment, you know, I'm very comfortable with the coalition agreements and arrangements that we've got with each other. Um, what we're wrestling with is a budget that's um, dealing with cost overruns, deliberate underfunding, and as I said, woeful delivery of, 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 of wasted money. So I mean, we're just working our way through those issues and working how we find the right balance between making sure we generate savings, uh, but also making sure that we have a pathway to to growing this country. That's ultimately how we get out of this. A report out today says it's now cheaper to run a fully electric home and car in New Zealand. Do you have any policies in the pipeline to encourage Kiwis to electrify? Yeah, well, we've talked a lot about increasing the electric vehicle um, charging units up and down across the country, a full EV charging network. We've also talked about wanting to double the amount of renewable electricity in this country through our Electrify NZ policy. That's why you've seen us move very quickly with fast track consenting so that we can actually get renewable energy projects uh, consented and then built quicker. It's, in, it's, it's ridiculous that it takes takes eight years to actually consent a wind farm, known technology, two years to build it, and we get the benefit in ten years' time. We can do that all with one year of, of consenting and two years of building and get it in three years' time. And with the cost of gas going up, why are some of your ministers hell-bent on saving the fossil fuel industry? Well, again, you know, we've talked about the fact that we will need gas as a transitionary energy source for some time in New Zealand as we build out and double the amount of renewable electricity. Well, Minister, you said um, Sorry, before Bill. those Nazi Germany comments, you, know, you, you don't agree with them. Uh, you know, you wish people would sort of lower the, the tone of the rhetoric. Yeah. But isn't it problematic when this is your foreign minister? We're, you know, in a, in a role where words are so important, that Mr. Peters is using language like this. Well, look, as again, all I can say is they're not the way that that's not the words that I would have used. Um, but equally, I see pol political leaders across the whole of Parliament using language that I don't think is very helpful, is inflammatory, uh, and doesn't maintain the civility in our politics. And so I urge I urge all leaders of all the political parties um, to actually think through their language before they respond. If he was a national minister, would you sack him? Well, again, I'm going to, uh, you know, Winston Peters and I talk a lot uh, and regularly. We haven't had a chance to catch up uh, today, but uh, we, will, we will at some point we'll talk about it. Minister, would you sack him for those comments? Uh, again, uh, I'm very clear about the fact that I don't think those comments are very helpful. No, it's, it's, Joe? Than, it's more than helpful, helpful though, isn't it, Prime Minister? He's, sorry, sorry, just go to Joe. Like, oh, carry on that topic. I've got a different topic. It's, yeah. it's, it's, more, more, than, than, yeah, it's more than unhelpful, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's not. I, I think there's a need for us to watch the inflammatory language that's used by all political leaders up and down this country. I don't think it's helpful when Chris Hipkins refers to the government as a dictatorship. I don't think it's helpful when the party might refer to us as white supremacists with a genocide agenda. Completely wrong. Do you think it's helpful when the media call women's rights campaigners Nazis when they're not? Prime Minister. Again, I'm just not getting into any of that, guys. Okay, Joe. Two Kiwis have been arrested in Thailand. Just wondering if you. Sorry. Two Kiwis have been arrested in Thailand. I'm just wondering if you have any information. Uh, no, on, I don't. At this on point. that, whether any help's been given 
Uh, I'm sure our consular services will be involved with that, but I haven't had a particular briefing uh, this afternoon about that. Can I ask you about the um, first home grants. Are you looking at increasing those for regional New Zealanders, seeing as they didn't have any movement on that in the last year? The first home loan grants. Oh, the, the first home, the loans. First home loans or yeah. the first oh, home sorry, grants? First home grants. First home grants. Uh, that's not under active consideration at this point. Uh, well, get them like four hundred thousand for the cargo. Like, is that not something you want to look at? It's not something I've taken any advice on, um, but it may be something that we take advice on in the next few weeks, but not currently. So, uh, sorry, can I go to Adam for last question, then I do have to run how, how committed is the government to avoiding final arbitration with respect to the police payoff? Well, look, I mean, um, we want to continue to negotiate in good faith. You know, that's the ideal way in which we can do that. I think over the last 30-something negotiations, there's been final arbitration, I think, five times um, over that period of time, if I remember correctly. Um, but, you know, for us, we want to continue to work with uh, the Police Association and continue to negotiate in good faith. How many police have skipped the ditch under your watch? Sorry? You know How many police have skipped the ditch under your watch? Do you know that number? Uh, I'm not going to give you a number off the top of my head without checking it, but I'll, uh, I'll give my past experience. Um, but I'll come back to you with that, Tober, if that's helpful. OK. Nicola Willis, then finance spokeswoman, said there would be, quote, no new taxes to working people. Can you restate that today? Well, again, what I said to you is we've got a budget that we're working up. Just wait for the budget. It's coming very shortly. Uh, but what we're dealing with is a dynamic set of economic circumstances, a massive determination to deliver tax relief to low- and middle-income New Zealanders, and we look forward to doing that at the budget. All right, thanks so much. Sorry, can we just get some numbers? Can we just get some numbers? Sorry. Minister Bishop, can we...